danger zone. He toggles a few switches and grins. This sim was promising to be one of the best ones yet. A new feature had been added. The repairs and reinforcement of the planetary information network had borne fruit, and now Hugh Hugh was going to fly with all the other hopefuls. Two dozen separate strike craft at locations that matched where they were actually playing from on the simulated Vuxa. This is Red Leader. All wings sound off. Red 1 standing by. The voice is deep and strong. Red 2 standing by. Also male with a slight rasp to his tone. Red 3 standing by. Male as well, stern and stoic. A man of few words. Red 4 standing by. Very scratchy and deep. But this man could sing. Red 5 standing by, Hugh Hugh adds in. His own code number for flights had been a gift from his brother-in-law Franklin, some kind of in-joke among the humans that had them chuckling. Red Squadron was all male and heavily encouraged by the undaunted men on the planet. Most of them, Hugh Hugh among them, had sworn the undaunted oath and wanted nothing more than to prove themselves. As green, yellow, and blue squadrons report in Hugh Hugh looks over the display, the world was divided into four quadrants which were divided further into another six smaller sections where each of their ships would launch from. The simulation had already begun. Something had triggered the outer alarms of the system. A threat was approaching and destroying everything that would give them a warning. As it approached, they would get a better look at it and were going to be sent out soon. A threat from beyond, unidentified and something they'd have to face regardless because sometimes you just have to gun the engine even if you don't know what you're facing. Where death itself could stomp on you at any moment, but you go anyways because people are relying on you to do your duty, even in the face of the unknown and unknowable. Visual on unknown threat incoming it, sweet goddess? Red Leader says out loud and Hugh Hugh's jaw drops at the image. It's a colossal battle station the size of a moon, it's large enough, it likely won't need artificial gravity because its mass alone will produce enough. It's roughly spherical, with a dividing line around its equator and a continent-sized disk for some kind of communication or possibly even a weapon. Then there's a readout. It is literally an artificial moon, and the disk is actually a weapon. Its sheer power output is stated to simply be off the charts with innumerable points for anti-ship weaponry mounted on it and many dozens of areas indicated as launch bays for enemy fighters. Holy hells, one of the green team gasps. It's official. The humans are absolutely insane and are going to either drive themselves into extinction or conquer the known universe. I can't tell which, Blue Leader states in a dumbfounded tone. Huh and we thought it'd be the war planets that would break your suspension of disbelief, Miles says over the lines. What are we even looking at, Yellow Leader demands incredulously. This is a Death Star, a planet-killing superweapon. That dish is a laser that can and will reduce Vuxa to dust unless you stop it. It has weaknesses, but it will take about 10 minutes of harassing and close proximity flying in order to expose it. Still want to try fighting? I don't know, you got any bigger? Someone on blue team asks, and there's some laughter. How much bigger? Another of the undaunted men asks, and there's a pause. Wait, you do have bigger? Hugh Hugh asks in shock. Welcome to the impossible levels, where your opponents start at the size of a moon, then the size of a planet, then a star, then a star system. Unfortunately, the computer system just ups and crashes if we try and go bigger, so no galaxy-sized threats yet. What? The Death Star is a moon-sized threat. The Beast Planet is a planet-eating abomination that's a fair bit bigger than Vuxa itself. So that's planet scale. The War Star is something Franklin came up with, crazy bastard, and it's an entire star contained in a shell and used as a fuel source for both engines and weapons. Finally, 
we've got the Annihilation Belt. It's probably the least well thought out of the four in that it's a ring world that's made of guns and automated drone launchers and controllers and such. Whose idea was this? Red Leader demands, and there's a rueful chuckle. Mine, I want you all to see how you do against the impossible. Franklin admits, and Hugh Hugh groans. The actual mission is that there's a powerful weapon pointing at the ground with a stupid level of point defenses and a massive screen of fighters. Are you skilled enough to pull it off? Fine, I'm in, Hugh Hugh says. But this better not be ranked because Blue Leader called it. You're crazy. That's fair. We call him crazy too, Miles says as Franklin chuckles in the sidelines. Anyways, game time. Pilots, our ships have been sabotaged. Our outer defenses have been compromised, but hope remains. Your ships are in pristine condition, and we have identified a weak spot in this battle station. The image of an insane maneuver before highlighting a tiny target appears. You will have to navigate down this trench and directly hit this exhaust port twice, first with plasma, and then with a magnetic round. This exhaust leads directly to the main reactor through numerous gravitational rifts. This thing's engine is ludicrously powerful and thankfully warps space in such a way that if you directly get a physical shot into the center of this exhaust port, it will carry through and into the main reactor to damage it severely, if not destroy it altogether. It's armor plated as well, so first you'll need to hit it with plasma before launching your magnetic rounds. You're not going easy on us, are you? Nope. We expect complete failure. Disappoint us soldiers. Consider that an order from your commanding officers. Aye, aye, sir, Hugh Hugh says with a grin. We'll take the lead. Red Squadron launch. Red Leader commands and Hugh Hugh hits the accelerator. He's flattened back against his seat, teeth showing bright as his fighter streaks upwards. Flames engulf him, and he looks out with first radar, then his eyes. He can vaguely make out several other ascending stars out to defend their homeworld. Look at the size of that thing. Red 2 gawks and Hugh Hugh chuckles. All the more to blow it up, boys. Come on, you want to let the ladies take all the fun? Red Leader asks, and cheers sound out. The IFFs read the whole of Red Squadron and thousands of enemy targets. Then the indicators that blue, green, and yellow are not going to be sitting on the sidelines flare up, and soon enough all four squadrons are rushing towards the enemy. All right, ladies, hike your skirts up and open up with full lasers. We've got limited plasma and magnetic rounds, make them all count, high priority targets only. Cook the chaff, no melting or shattering it. Yellow Leader broadcasts on all channels. Hear that, gents? The ladies think they're going to protect us. Red Leader snipes into the channel as they form a V in space to let loose a massive cooperative burn into the heart of the oncoming opponents. The orbs with a square welded to each side scatter, and Red Squadron does likewise, burning massive lances of lasers across the battlefield. Shit! Hugh Hugh curses as he activates a sideways burn on his fighter to dodge away from a burst laser attack. Burst lasers! They're packing burst lasers! Acknowledged. Red Squadron, recalibrate shields to burst laser frequencies and open your scanners wide. We need their actual frequency cycle yesterday, and the longer we're vulnerable, the worse off we are. Red Leader states, and Hugh Hugh nods even as he finishes adjusting his shield frequencies and checking his emergency thrust fuel. He'd lost nearly 5% in that one maneuver alone. These ships were absurdly nimble in space but had no staying power. 20, maybe 21 or 22 extreme maneuvers before they were stuck using the same basic maneuvering systems as everyone else. This was a new add-on since Hugh Hugh's last big flight. They were as much testing out new ideas as they were practicing to be pilots. The ships evolved and advanced as they worked on them. A good thing, too, as the burst lasers were as plentiful as rain in a hurricane and twice as aggressive. Thankfully, burst lasers were a sort of sidestep rather than advancement on lasers. Short burst attacks on linked cannons on rotating frequencies made for a nasty punch.
They'd move around most shields, but if you could get into the pattern yourself, they were actually borderline useless. Burst lasers were a spray-and-pray weapon. If the weapon's frequency was synced to an army's shield frequency and equipped en masse throughout an army, said army only needed to aim in the general direction of their opponents and be practically guaranteed to hit a target somewhere. However, burst lasers would fail the moment the enemy also found out the frequency, so the smarter types would put them on a cycle, but that too could be hacked. The whole thing is using a burst laser setup? I get that the bastards are popular in space, but this is ridiculous, one of the Yellow Squadron shouts. Cut the chatter and focus, ladies. I'm uploading the frequencies I've gotten off a few of these wrecks. Use them well. Green Leader commands, and there's a quick info packet that follows. Hugh Yu has his shields adjust to the frequencies inside just in time to bounce off a burst laser blast from several different enemy fighters. They're safe until the buggers start using a different frequency cycle. This is Blue Squadron. We're going for a trench run. We need cover. You heard the Lady Red Squadron. Give the Blues some damn cover already, Red Leader commands. And Hugh Hugh starts going towards the trench and opens up a few quick burns on his laser to cook a few of the enemy fighters. Blue, Red, some new kind of fighter are coming in hard and fast. They're... Someone on green begins before being cut off. We've lost green three. We've got actual enemies on the field. The rest are automated defense drones, green leader exclaims, and everything descends into sheer chaos. The basic fighters go from panicky to focused as they form up on more angular versions of themselves that prove themselves to have defensive barriers capable of resisting basic lasers and not just the absolute rain of burst lasers blasting everywhere. Something flickers and Hugh Hugh jolts his ship to the side. He can't see it, but his sensors do. He just dodged a magnetic round at barely three kilometers distance and it missed by barely 10 meters. Damn, no one's that lucky twice. He's already on borrowed time. Fine, you want me? Come get me. He adjusts his heading to meet the formation head-on and thin his profile as much as possible to them. He then launches a magnetic shot under the cover of a full burn onto the main opponent. His sensors pick up a transmission from the main station to its drones, different from the basic controls, and the simulation shuts down as all his systems are destroyed in an instant. He leans back in frustration. They change the frequency cycle or added something new to it. Damn, I wonder how many of us that got. He opens the pod and climbs out before pressing a few buttons on the side. Almost everyone? We really weren't ready for that, he asks with a slight chuckle. Most of red and green had been picked off right after the frequency cycle had been altered. They weren't able to dodge in time at that range. Then he smiles as the victory screen goes up anyways. It hadn't mattered. They'd attracted enough attention and bought enough time for Blue to make a successful attack run. Apparently they had gone into walker mode and had just bombarded the target with everything until they got the perfect shot. No one got away from the station before the explosion took it out, but at the same time, it was a win. He presses a few buttons and his smile turns a bit more genuine as he sees that his last shot actually shattered one of the maneuvering engines of the main enemy pilot and caused them to careen out of control and slam into a station sensor tower. It had blinded it just enough to give Blue Squadron all the time it needed. He's invited into the voice chat and he accepts. You all right there, half size? You're the youngest pilot of us all, Red Leader asks and Hugh Hugh bites back the urge to curse the man out. I'm fine. In a fighter, it's only skill that matters, and I've put in as much time if not more than anyone else on the team. All right, relax. It wasn't an attack. I was put in charge of this mini squadron, and I intend to do that justice, which means checking in on everyone. You're just someone else I'm responsible for, just another pilot to me. Thanks. Yeah, I'm fine. I even got a good hit or two in, and I was eliminated almost instantly. It was a little shocking, but no long moment of a simulated burnout and crash. You're pretty tough to take all this without issue, or 
Is this a side effect of swearing that undaunted oath or whatever it is? There is something about it. Makes you feel stronger, like you're taking charge, Hugh Hugh says, and there's a slight hum from the other side. It's not something to swear lightly, though. Is it just me, or do humans not seem to have any option but crazy or intense? Yeah, I get that, too. I mean, my sister is married to one, and it's that extra crazy flavor in the form of Franklin, the red-coated axiom adept that straight up murdered the horrors. He outright played with them before killing them, and that's more than a little messed up. They, they're on our side. They're good people, but there's something wrong with them, Hugh Hugh says, and there's a silence from the other side. Yeah, yeah, that's it exactly. There's something almost indescribably wrong with them. It's not that they're violent. Plenty of violent races and peoples. It's not that they're military. There are more militaries than you can count. It's not that they're ambitious. People go off into frontier and wild space to forge little empires all the time. It's not that they look scary. If anything, they look normal and boring. I think that's it, though. Hugh Hugh interrupts him. Yeah, it's that the way they look and sound isn't the sort of thing you expect something like that to come from. Trets are everywhere, but they're harmless. Humans, though, not harmless, and you know it. So it comes across as creepy, like some monster is wearing a tret skin. Yeah, I think that's it. Don't get me wrong. I'm grateful. I really am. Still freaky, though. It is. Yes, it is. 